Let's turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, as we continue our series addressing the present truth. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 12. Are we there, my friends? The Bible in verse number 12 of 2 Peter speaks to us about the present truth. Let's read that together. 2 Peter chapter 1, Father in heaven, bless us now as we continue the study of your words. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Verse number 12, together, what it says here, friends? Wherefore, I would not be negligent. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse number 12. Wherefore, I would not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in what truth? In the present truth. Now, for those of you who have been studying with us, we have been going through this series addressing present truth. Amen? All right, and we saw in previous studies that present truth is found in verse 12 through verse number 21, addressing a specific prophecy, which is found in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Chapter 9 of Daniel, verse 24 through verse number 27, which is the 2300 prophetic days that this is indeed present truth. And we're told in the book, Early Writings, Page 63. Listen to what this statement says. It says, There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. I have seen the danger of the messengers running off from the important points of present truth to dwell upon subjects that are not calculated to unite the flock and sanctify the soul. Satan will here take every possible advantage to injure the cause. But such subjects as the sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus are perfectly calculated to explain the past Advent movement and to show what our present position is. Establish the faith of the doubting and give certainty to what future, my friends? These I have frequently seen were the principal subjects on which who should dwell. Go with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 8. Where are we going to, my friends? But such subjects as a sanctuary in connection with the 2300 days, the commandments of God, and the faith of Jesus, these principal truths entail and comprise present truth for God's people in these last days. We discovered in a previous lesson that present truth is also seen in the three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through verse number 12. Now notice with me now, chapter 8 of Daniel and verse number 14. Read that with me. And he said unto me, unto what, my friends? Unto 2,300 days. What, my friends? Then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now notice what other truth. Look at the screen here. When did the 2,300 prophetic days begin? In what year? In 457 B.C. autumn. And came to an end when? In October 22nd, 1844, Autumn. I want to ask you a question. What's today's date? This is the 21st of October. So what is tomorrow's date? The 22nd of October. So what memorial comes on tomorrow as Seventh-day Adventist Bible-believing Christians? What is tomorrow a memorial of? Oh, my friends, the work of investigative judgment being conducted by Jesus Christ where? In the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And we cannot lose focus. We cannot forget the great work of Jesus Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. This is present truth. That's why today, I had many more things to say, but I said, Lord, this must be it. Since October 22nd is tomorrow, there must be a message to remind us of the great work of Jesus Christ 
being performed right now in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Because not until that work is completed can Jesus Christ return. Look with me. Chapter 9 of Daniel. Look at verse 24. We have covered and we have connected that chapter 8 of Daniel, verse 14, and chapter 9 of Daniel, verse 24 through verse 27, are intimately connected. Chapter 9 of Daniel is the explanation, given the starting date, of Daniel chapter 8 and verse number 14. This is present truth. Look at the screen right here, my friends. This quotation from Selected Messages, book 1, page 357. The Word of God says that the message of righteousness by faith, that this is present truth for God's people in these last days. It says this, watch carefully. We thank the Lord with all the heart that we have precious light to present before the people. And we rejoice that we have a message for this time, which is what? Talk to me. Which is present truth. What is present truth based on this statement? Red words, the tidings that Christ is our righteousness has brought what, my friends? Has brought relief to many, many souls. And God says to his people, do what? Go forward. Then it says, the message to whom? The Laodicean church is applicable to our condition. How plainly is pictured the position of those who think that they have all the truth, who take pride in their knowledge of the Word of God, while its sanctifying power has not been felt in their lives. The fervor of the love of God is wanting in their hearts, but it is this very fervor of love that makes God's people, the what, my friends? The salt of the earth. Yea, the light of the world. Daniel chapter 9. Go there with me. Look at verse number 24 now. The Bible tells us, oh, my friends, is this present truth? The Bible tells us in verse number 24 of chapter 9 of Daniel, how many prophetic days were allotted to the Jewish people. Based on verse 24, they had 70 prophetic days. Pardon me. 70 prophetic weeks. Let's read that. Verse 24, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to do what things? To finish the what? The transgression. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. This was probationary time. Question for you. What date began the 70 prophetic weeks? The 490 literal years for the Jewish people. What date? 457 BC autumn. Then when did it come to an end? It came to an end, come on, AD 34, autumn. This was probationary time. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. So that means then, note this on your paper. Get your writing instruments, get your note papers. Put this point then, the whole 2300 prophetic days represent pro probationary time. It points to what, my friends? Probationary time. Go back to verse 24. In this probationary time, what was expected of the Jewish people as a nation? What were they to do in verse 24? Put down these four things. What were they to do? Number one, they were to finish the transgression. Put that down. Put it down, my friends. They were to make, number two, they were to make an end of sins. Number three, they were to make reconciliation for iniquity. And what is number four? Come on. What is number four, my friends? They were to bring in what? They were to bring in everlasting righteousness. Is that point clear? And what was expected 
of the Jewish people in their probationary time is expected of God's people, yeah, Seventh-day Adventist, Bible-believing, professed Christians in these last days, just before the second coming of Jesus Christ. Know this point, before we die, before the mark of the beast is enforced, before the close of human probation, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, God expects of all of us to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. Hold your place in chapter 9 of Daniel. Go with me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 22. Can death come at any time, my friends? Yes. I, I didn't hear you. Yes. Amen. Revelation chapter 22. And notice now, in verse number 11, the Bible tells us that one day Christ is going to say, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. Watch this now. He that is righteous, finish it. Let him be righteous still. Does that imply everlasting righteousness? They who are righteous remain righteous still. What's in verse number 12 now? What's in verse number 12 now? And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give unto every man according as his work shall be. This confirms that just before we die, before the mark of the beast is enforced, before the close of human probation, before the second coming of Jesus Christ, that God expects of us to finish the transgression, make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in what? Talk to me. Everlasting righteousness. What's in verse number 14 of the 22nd chapter of Revelation? Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into where? Into the city. Is this point clear, my friends? We must put an end to sin to finish the transgression. That simply means, don't forget this point, that simply means all the preaching on the sanctuary message, all the talk about the cleansing of the sanctuary, this, these things will never take place until the cleansing first take place in our hearts. Is that point clear, my friends? All the talk about the sanctuary, the cleansing of the sanctuary, the second coming of Jesus, if the messages do not emphasize putting an end to sin, finishing transgression, and bringing in everlasting righteousness, it is not a biblical message. It's not present truth. It is another gospel. Paul calls it in the book of Galatians, it is the perversion of the everlasting gospel. Is there a heavenly sanctuary? Is there one? What work is Christ doing since October 22nd, 1844? What work up there, my friends? Is he conducting the work of the cleansing of the sanctuary? Is he? Does Christ want to finish transgression? Does Christ want to make an end of sins? Who is the author of sin? Does Christ want to bring an end to the author of sin? Bring an end to sin itself? Does Christ want to bring in everlasting righteousness? When there will be no more sorrow, no more death, what brings death? Sin. For the wages of sin is death. No more pain. Does Christ want to bring an end to pain and to bring in everlasting righteousness? But before this can take place in heaven, the church of God must first finish the transgression, make an end of sin, 
bring in everlasting righteousness and also make reconciliation for iniquity. Go with me in your Bibles. Ephesians chapter 5. Where are we going to, my friends? Look with me. At verse 25 of Ephesians chapter 5, God's words says this. Are we there, my friends? Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might do what now? Sanctify. What are the next few words? And cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself, a what church? A glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be how? Holy and without blemish. And what will Christ say just before he comes? Based on the 22nd chapter of the Revelation and verse number 11, he that is righteous, let him be what? And he that is holy, let him be what? So before Christ can say those words, what must happen in the life of the church? In the church members, they must be cleansed. So Christ can what? Present them to himself as a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and how? Without blemish. Is that point clear, my friends? Go back with me to Daniel chapter 9. Where are we going to, my friends? Daniel chapter 9. Christ says, we all oh, first know these four points. Finish the transgression. Make an end of sin. Make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in everlasting righteousness. Question, do you know what reconciliation is based on scripture? Put this point down, based on scripture, reconciliation. It means uniting with Jesus so we can receive power to obey the Ten Commandments. That is the biblical definition of reconciliation. Uniting with Jesus Christ in order to receive power to obey the Ten Commandments. Does anyone know what the end result is if we hold on to iniquity? <laughs> the end result of holding on to iniquity is that we will be forever separated from God. The Bible tells us in Isaiah chapter 59, God's hand is not shortened that he cannot see. Neither is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But what, my friend? But it is our iniquities that have separated between us and our God. Then what is reconciliation? It is a work of God to bring us into harmony with the Father so that we will not be separated from God forever. Who wants to be united with God? Raise your hand, my friend. And hands down, go with me, Isaiah chapter 59. Where are we going to, my friends? Isaiah chapter, let's read that, verse number one. Let's make sure we get this. Are we there, my friends? Isaiah chapter 59. Look with me at verse, let's all read verse one together. Behold, let's read that. The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot see, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have what? Separated between you and your God. Notice now, and your sins have done what, my friends? So what is the end result if we hold on to sin and refuse to make an end of sin? What will be the end result? Not only separation from God, but what does verse 2 say? Your sins have done what to God? Your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Understand that, my friends. That's why Christ says we must make an end of sins. And this is reconciliation. Uniting with Jesus that we can be prepared to behold the face of Jesus. 
Put down on your note paper, Genesis chapter 32 and verse number 13. It was the patriarch Jacob who said these words. He says, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. That is reconciliation, my friends. But notice, what steps did Jacob have to take? What did Jacob experience before Jacob could say, I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved. Talk to me. What happened to Jacob before this? Was he pricked that a crisis was coming? Do you see it, my friends? So what now must the church of God hear? They must hear of a coming crisis. Is that point clear, my friends? Did Jacob spend all night in prayer? So because a coming crisis is looming on the horizon, the mark of the beast crisis is nearing. What must God's people, like Jacob, be found doing in their homes, in their home churches, even in their churches, spending time? in prayer and fasting to be prepared for the coming crisis so God can protect and preserve us. And what question has God wrestled with Jacob? What question did God ask Jacob? What is thy name? And what does name signify, my friends? Talk to me. Name signifies character in scripture. And what was the patriarch's response? Oh, my name is Jacob. And what does Jacob mean? Come on, friends, we know it. A supplanter, a liar, a cheat, a deceiver. Did Jacob confess his sins? Yes, yes my friends. And what did, then did God do? What then did God say? Thou shalt no more be called Jacob, but what? Israel. Why? Because you are now a prince now an overcomer then now jacob could say then now israel could say i have seen god face to face and my life is preserved that jacob make an end of sin that jacob see god's face and was preserved hold that point go with me your bibles to revelation chapter 6 where are we going to my friends Yet on the contrast, the Bible teaches that when the second coming of Jesus is about to take place, the unrepentant men, husbands, women, wives, boys, girls, those who are unrepentant, the leaders who are unrepentant, the common peasants who are unrepentant, administrators and laity, those who are unrepentant, the Bible tells us, in chapter 6 of Revelation, that they will be running to where? The rocks and the mountains. And guess what they will say? I wonder what they will say. Friends, we don't want to be in that group. Amen, my friends. And that's why we're here locally in North Carolina. And that's why now you're online, safe to serve international and worshiping with us. What will they say, the unrepentant? What will they say? Fall and us. Fall on us and what and hide us from what from what from the face of him that sitteth upon the throne and from the wrath of the lamb why for the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand what is the wrath of God the wrath of God is the seven last plagues. And what event triggers the seven last plagues, the wrath of God? It is the mark of the beast crisis. So when must we make an end of sins? When must we make an end of sins that we may be able to behold the face of Jesus Christ? When, my friends, it is now, is the mark of the beast crisis near? 
And notice, we must be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ, like Jacob, making an end of sins, so we can behold the face of Jesus, be sealed. Who shall be able to stand? Those who are sealed. Chapter 7, verse 1 through verse 4. Those who have the seal of God where? In their foreheads, the name of God, the name of the Father, the character of God. Look at the screen right here, my friends. This is sons and daughters of God. Page 368, it says this. Watch carefully. In view of these encouraging promises, how earnestly... Should we strive to perfect a character that will enable us to stand before whom? Come on, to stand before whom? The Son of God. Let's read those red words now together slowly. Only those who are clothed in the garments of his righteousness will be able to endure the glory of his presence when he shall appear with power and great glory. Contrastingly, what will the unrepentant be running to the rocks and mountains and saying, based on chapter 6 of the Revelation, verse 15 through verse 17, fall on us and hide us from what? The face of him that sitteth upon the throne. But based on this statement on the screen, what must we have on in order to endure the glory of Christ's second coming, my friends? What must we have on? The righteousness of Christ. Is this present truth? Do you want it, my friends? Which group do I want to be in? Which group do you want to be found in? The second paragraph goes on to say, watch carefully, it means much to be an overcomer. The besetments of the enemy and all his evil agencies must be what, my friends, firmly resisted. Every moment we must be on our guard. Not for one instant are we to lose sight of Christ and of his power to save in the hour of trial. Let's all read the last sentence. Where must our hand be found? Our hand must be placed in his that we may be upheld by what? By the power of his might. Chapter 3 of the Revelation. Go there with me. Chapter 3, the Revelation. So where must our hand be found? That means we are walking with Jesus. And can two walk together except they be agreed? Chapter 3 of the Revelation. Look how verse number 4 puts it. Chapter 3. Verse 3 mentions repentance. Right? And chapter 4 now says, Thou hast how many? Only a few will be saved in these last days, my friends. I want to be in that number. How about you? It says... Is it possible then for us to be in that few? It's possible. Would you say amen? amen. You don't sound convincing. Would you say amen? amen? Is it possible for you and I to be in that number? Amen. The few, verse 4, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, even in Raleigh, North Carolina. <laughs> All right, my friends, which have not defiled their garments, and they what, my friends? And they shall what? Walk with me in what? White. For they are what? Worthy. The one who overcomes the same shall be clothed in what, my friends? In white raiment. And what will Christ not do? He will not blot out their names. Close that with me. Go with me now to the 22nd chapter of the Revelation. Revelation 22, look with me at verse number 3. The Bible tells us as we walk hand in hand with Jesus, Christ will clothe us with his righteousness as we confess our sins, as we receive godly sorrow for sin, then we can behold his face and be preserved and not be running to the rocks and mountains saying, 
fall on us. Chapter 22 of the Revelation, verse number 3. Are we there, my friends? We must make an end of sins. Verse 3, are we there? It says this, and there shall be no more what? Curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servant shall serve him. Let's all read verse 4 now. And they shall do what, my friends? And they shall see his face, and his name shall be there in their foreheads. Go back with me to Isaiah chapter 59. We must finish the transgression. Make an end of sins. Make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness. When I ask you, what is sin? What is sin, my friends? Sin is the transgression of the law. So reconciliation then means uniting with Jesus so he can give us power to make an end of sins and to obey his commandments. This is Bible reconciliation. If that's clear, my friends, say amen. amen. Then what is transgression then? That we must finish. Finish the transgression. Transgression is disobeying God's Ten Commandments. So what is Bible reconciliation? Uniting with Jesus. How often? Evening, morning, and at noon, based on Isaiah 55. Verse 16, verse 17. So now Jesus can give us power to finish transgression, make an end of sins, make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in what, my friends? Everlasting righteousness. What is that? What is everlasting righteousness? Anybody knows? What is everlasting righteousness? Anybody knows, my friends? What? It's the law. Go to Psalm 119 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Psalm 119. Look with me. Verse 142. Psalm 119. Verse 142. Are we there, my friends? It says this. Let's read verse 142 together. What it says here, my friends? Thy righteousness is what? Talk to me. It's what, my friends? It is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Skip on down to verse 44. The righteousness of thy testimonies is what? Everlasting. Give me understanding and I shall live. So what is everlasting righteousness? It is God's Ten Commandments. So what is Bible reconciliation? Uniting with Jesus Christ so he can give us power to obey the Ten Commandments, thus, my friends, we bring in everlasting righteousness. We finish the transgression, make an end of sins, and make reconciliation for iniquity. This is present truth for God's people in these last moments of earth's history. And the question is, do you want to be saved? The question is, do you believe that Jesus can give you power? If you don't believe it, you will never receive it. Some of you are asking now, do you believe that Christ can give you power to live about sin? Power to finish the transgression. Power to make an end of sins. Put this on your paper right now. Don't you miss this point. Reconciliation means then the balancing of our account in heaven. The what, my friends? Have you ever heard the term, let us reconcile the accounts? All right, my friends. Are we in debt to God? Yes. Have we all sinned? Yes. Then are we sinners then? Yes. And what was to happen for the Jewish people in their time of probation? To make reconciliation for iniquity. So what must happen in our lives before we die? And before the second coming of Jesus, our accounts must be what? Reconciled. I want to ask you a question. Can you reconcile your account? You sure? Can you reconcile your own account? So who must do it then, my friends? It's only Jesus that can reconcile 
our account, not men. If you could do it, there would be no need for Jesus. Look at the screen right here, my friends. This is a Bible commentary, volume 6, page 10, 7 to 3. From top, it says this, by faith. Let's, come on, let's read this. By faith, he can bring to God the merits of Christ. And the Lord places the obedience of his son to whose account? To the sinner's account. And then the account is reconciled. Read on. Christ's righteousness is accepted in place of, of what? Of man's failure. And God receives, oh my friends, pardons, yes, justifies, yes, whom? Who will God receive? Pardon and justify. Who, my friends? It says, uh, the repentant believing soul. They must go together. The repentant believing soul. And what now? And treat him. Put your name there. And treat blank. Put your name there. And treat Andrew as though he were righteous. Praise God. And loves me. And loves you as the Father loves Jesus, his Son. Our oh, beloved. This is how faith is what now? Accounted as righteousness. Second paragraph. My life today. Page 273. It's a potent statement. Reconciliation. The account must be reconciled. Look at this. It says, the believing sinner. The who, my friends? What is another word for belief? Faith. And that's what's called righteousness by faith. Right doing by faith. Believing that Jesus will give us strength to obey his laws. If that's clear, say amen. It says, the believing sinner is pronounced how? Innocent. Oh, my friends. While the guilt is placed on Christ. That's in the Bible. Isaiah chapter 53 and verse number 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has placed upon him the iniquity of whom? Of us all. This is the mystery. Of the plan of salvation my friends we are pronounced innocent while the guilt back to the screen is placed on Christ let's read now the righteousness of Christ is placed on whose account on whose account how many have sinned oh my friends you don't look convincing how many have sinned yes now you sound convincing all of sin and what is the wages of sin yeah. what death is this the second or the first death it's the second death why it's in contrast to everlasting life we are in debt our account has been in the red somebody must bring it out of red from being in debt to now being sufficient in the eyes of God, back to the screen, the righteousness of Christ is placed on the debtor's account. Let's read this now. And against his name, on what sheet? Oh, my friends, on what sheet in heaven? On what ledger, you accountants? On what ledger in heaven? On the balance sheet is written. What words? Ah, oh, beloved. What words? What three words? Pardon, full stop. I like that. Pardon, period. I like that, my friends. No ellipses, no commas. Pardon, period. What is the next sentence? Eternal life. Who wants this, my friends? Oh, my friends, we must make an end of sins. We must finish the transgression. Our accounts must be what? Reconciled from iniquity and what must we bring in everlasting righteousness but can we do it who must we accept 
Who must we surrender to? Who must we give our lives? Who must we walk hand in hand with? It's Jesus Christ. Will he make reconciliation, my friend? Will he reconcile our accounts? Do you believe it? Put on your paper the first step. The first what, my friend? The first step for us to finish the transgression. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. To make an end of sins. To make reconciliation for iniquity. And to bring in everlasting righteousness is to accept the one. Is to accept the person who became man like us. Is to accept the man who took on sinful nature and never transgressed the laws. Is to accept Jesus who never sinned as a man. The first step for us to finish sin is to accept Jesus who never sinned as a man. The first step to live a righteous life is to accept Jesus who as a man was declared righteous. Never sinned. Will you accept him today, my friends? Go to Romans chapter 8 with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Go to Romans chapter 8 with me. And what says verse number 3 of Romans chapter 8? For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son, praise God, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, what did our Savior do as he took on sinful flesh? What did he do, my friends? He condemned sin in the flesh. Did Christ finish transgression? Did he triumph over sin? Yes. Watch this now. Verse number 3, verse 4, Romans chapter 8. And for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. For what purpose? What is in verse number 4? So that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in whom? In us. What might be fulfilled in us? The righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. Does that sound like bringing in everlasting what? Oh, friends, you got it. Does that sound like bringing in everlasting righteousness? So again, I ask you the question, do you believe that Jesus took on sinful flesh based on scripture? Did he sin as a man? No. Do you believe it? Then that belief must be translated and cause you to believe you can also live above sin. Do you believe it, my friends? Are you sure? This is the first step. He triumphed over sin. Quote with me, Hebrews chapter 4. Verse number 14 says, For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points, how many points? All. all points, tempted as we are, yet without sin. What is in verse 60 now? Therefore do what now? Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find what? And find grace to help in what, my friends? In time of need, it is to accept Jesus who as man never sinned. Now we have power, my friends, oh beloved, to finish transgression. I'm going to give you something. To make an end of sin. And what did Jesus say on Calvary's cross? What did he say was finished? Oh beloved, it is finished. He triumphed over sin. Oh, beloved, as a result now, can we finish transgression in our lives? Can we make an end of sin? I want to give you a natural analogy. How does one get rid of carbon dioxide out of his lungs and body? How? Number one, by exhaling. But what must be done first before we can exhale? You're not talking to me. What must be done first before we can exhale? We must first inhale. And what must we inhale to exhale the poison? Carbon dioxide. What must we inhale? 
oxygen. Is that healthy? Is that good? So based on nature, to get rid of the poison, to get rid of that which is bad in the life, what must we first do? Inhale. Bring in that which is pure, that which is good, that which is wholesome. And the more good and pure and wholesome thing you bring in, you get power now, you're following this, to expel the poison, even the poison of sin. Is that clear for you, my friend? Is it possible for us to get victory over sin? Do you want something else that's juicy and fruity and meaty from God's word? Look at the screen right here. This is Selected Messages, book one, page 396. This hinges on what we are studying. In what prophecy from top? In what prophecy? In the prophecy of Daniel. Listen, listen carefully. In the prophecy of Daniel, it was, it was recorded of Christ that he shall do what? So who can do this? Who alone can do this? That he shall make reconciliation for iniquity and bring in what, my friends? Everlasting righteousness. Back to the screen. What must every soul say now? The red word says uh, every soul must say this. Will you read with me now? Red words. It says this. Come on now. Every soul may say. Are you a soul? Raise your hand if you're a soul. Amen. God formed man out of what? The dust of the ground and what? Breathe into what? The, what? the breath of? And man became a living. Are you a living soul today? Every soul must say, let's say it now, solemnly. Let's read that, what it says. By his perfect obedience, he, Jesus, was satisfied, has satisfied the claims of the law. And my only hope is found in looking to him as my substitute and surety who obeyed the law perfectly for me. So what is our only hope? What, what must we say? Oh, friends, is Jesus our surety? Is Christ our substitute? Did he obey the law perfectly for us? Oh, my friends, so what then must we do so our account in heaven may be balanced, may be reconciled, just to confess and live in his presence? What else must we say? Read on black words now. What else must we say? By faith, in his merits, I am free from the condemnation of the law. He clothes me with his righteousness, which answers all the demands of the law. I am, what must we say, my friends? I am what? Pause right there. Let's say those five words again. I am complete in him. One more time. I am complete in him. Read on. Who brings in what? Are you getting this, my friend? I am complete in him. Who brings in what? Everlasting righteousness. What? Come on, keep talking. He presents me to God in the spotless garment of which no thread was woven by any human agent. That means Jesus is our tailor. Any tailor inside here? Online. Jesus is our seamstress. And inside here? Online. Amen. Let's go to him for the garment, the robe of righteousness. Our garment will not do. Read on. All is of Christ, and all the glory, honor, and majesty are to be given to whom? Which taketh away what now? Thus, oh my, will he make? Will he give us power to make and end our sins in our lives? Will he, my friends? Do you believe it? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Where are we going to, my friends? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, put on your paper now, reconciliation in the Bible is used in the context of marriage. In what context? Marriage. Who must we be married to? 
Who must we be married to? We must finish the transgression, right? Make an end of sins, right, my friends? And make reconciliation for iniquity. And the Bible says, watch carefully, reconciliation must be done in the context of marriage. 1 Corinthians 7. You must know where I'm going now, right, my friends? 1 Corinthians 7, that means before we die, husband and wife, make sure you are reconciled with God and reconciled with each other. Or else you are a walking dead. 1 Corinthians 7, verse number 10 says, And unto the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, let not the wife depart from her husband. But, and if she depart, let her remain unmarried, or be what now? Reconciled to her husband, and let not the husband put away his wife, but something terrible has transpired within God's remnant movement, Seventh-day Adventism, based on scripture, it was never God's will for divorce. Never, my friends. Never. But God gave it. Why? Based on the hardness of our hearts. And then God says, this is uh, the condition by which divorce will be accepted in my son. What is that condition? Oh, uh, my friends, it is adultery. But today in our church, in the church manual, elders manual, it says for what? Irreconcilable differences. So if your wife burns the beans, you can divorce her. That's simple words, my friends. So if you do not like what she's doing, or he, you may divorce. Irreconcilable difference. That ain't scripture, my friends. That is not scripture. It's against the word of God. And the Bible says, before we die, the second coming of Jesus, the mark of this, we must make reconciliation for iniquity. Not only from Christ's perspective, but the perspective of marriage between a husband and wife. It's going on right now as I speak. Ministers divorcing wives for no reason that's biblical. How will they stand in a judgment? Church members, the laity, the common people, husbands, wives divorcing. He's or her spouse, and the reason is not biblical. In God's sight, you are a debtor, and probation is about to close. Death can come at any time, and in the time of probation, God expects reconciliation for iniquity in the context of marriage. Isaiah chapter 61. Go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, take these points and bring it to prayer. Lord, is it me that is now wanting? Is it I that is guilty? God says reconciliation for iniquity must be done in the context of marriage. Let's get back to Christ now. Isaiah chapter 61. The Bible tells us in verse number 10, what must we have on? in order to be married to Christ. What, my friend? What does marriage mean? Matthew 19, verse 5 and verse 6. The two shall become one. Is Christ righteous? Is he righteous? So, so now, what is the marriage then? What must we have on? We must have on the righteous character, the robe, the garment of Christ's righteousness. That, that is what we find. In verse number 10 of Isaiah chapter 61, we must have on the righteous raiment, garment, character of Christ. Beloved, some of you look strange right now. <laughs> Pastor, the minute you touch marriage, <laughs> the countenance changed in the group a while ago. It just changed. I'm like, Lord, have mercy upon our souls. It changed. That means God is talking to us. And just as Jesus is getting ready to consummate the heavenly marriage with the city, Jerusalem, with us, his people, marriages 
are on the rocks down here on the earth. Division is going on in the home. And the Bible says, a home divided. Finish it. A home divided. What, my friends, cannot stand. And what is the question in chapter 6 of the Revelation? And verse number 17, for the great day of his wrath is come. And what is the question? And who shall be able to stand? Mm. It's time to fix our marriages. If there's no biblical reason for divorce, my friends, bring in what? Reconciliation. Do you see it now? Look at Isaiah 61. It can be done, my friends. How, how on earth do we want Christ to reconcile our account? But we refuse to reconcile with our spouse. Oh, my friends, we shall be found wanting. So much more can be said. Go to verse number 11. Isaiah chapter 61. Verse number 11. God's word says this. It's possible for Jesus to make us righteous. We must believe it. Amen, my friends. I want to ask a question. Has anyone done planting recently? Planting. Seeds. Anyone? Anyone, friends? When you put the seed in that ground, in that pot with dirt, can you make it grow? What is your job? To put the seed in the ground and what else? To water it and to give it sunlight, right? Give it ear, ear pockets, right? But can you make that seed grow? No. Can you make that seed bear fruit? It's one of the fruit of God, righteousness, patience. Yes, my friends, question now. Can we be a fruit of ourselves? What's our job? To put the word in. In our mind, evening, morning, and at noon. And what will Christ do? As he does in the natural sphere, he in the spiritual sphere will make us grow and bear fruit to God's glory. Look at verse number 11. Isaiah chapter 61, verse number, let's all read that. What it says, friends, for as the what? The earth bringeth forth the bud, and as the garden cause the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God, who will cause righteousness to spring forth. So Christ, my friends, will make us righteous. Do you believe it? Go to Matthew chapter 5. Where are we going to, my friends? Beloved, if we don't believe this, we're not going to make it. We won't be righteous. We have to believe it, that in Christ, we can be declared righteous if we just come to him. If we have godless sorrow, if we surrender every known sin to God, he will pardon, justify, and clothe us with his righteousness character our account in heaven will be reconciled we can see god's face face to face and not be consumed and the songwriter says face to face with christ my savior face to face oh what will it be oh when in rapture i behold him who is he my friend matthew chapter 5 where are we going to my friend Look at Matthew chapter 5 with me and verse number 22. The second point you want to write down, biblical reconciliation is not only in the context of marriage, but in the context of brotherly unity. The biblical reconciliation is also in the context of brotherly unity. In other words, none of us will ever lift ourselves off this earth until we have unity between ourselves as brothers and sisters, literally siblings, and brothers and sisters in the church. So if we profess present truth, but we're living like devils, we are lost. Jesus can never reconcile our account in heaven as long as we refuse to reconcile ourselves, to reconcile the differences that we have among each other. Write down this quotation. 
Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 143. God's Messenger. Sister White says, Oh, my friends, I saw that many have so much rubbish piled up at the doors of their hearts that they cannot get the door open. Some have difficulties between themselves and their brethren to remove. Let that sink in. Others have evil tempers, selfish, covetousness to remove. Some have rolled the world before the doors of their hearts, which bars the door. All this rubbish must be taken away so that the doors can be open and Jesus may come in. What is one of those rubbish? We are told some have difficulties between themselves and their brethren to remove reconciliation in the context of brotherly love. Matthew chapter 5. Go there with me, my friend. Where are we going to? Look at verse 23. Verse 23. The Bible says this. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to wear, that's the church, to the altar, and there, and there, while you're at the altar, you come to worship, you're in church, rememberest that thy brother hath what, my friends? Ought against thee. What does verse 24 say? It says, leave there thy gift before the altar. And what must we do? Go thy way. First be what now? Reconciled to thy brother. And then come and offer thy gift. Go to Acts 2 with me. And then offer thy gift. And just as we are nearing death for some of us just as we're nearing the mark of the beast crisis just as we're nearing the close of doom and probation it is satan's plan to bring within seventh day adventism the spirit of strife the spirit of division the spirit of differences we're not talking about calling sin by its right name and identifying the apostasies and the apostates among us. But I'm talking about no brotherly love be seen among us. When one side of the people say, I don't like those people. And they over there say, well, we don't like those people over there. Neither groups are going to heaven. There must be reconciliation. me. There must be reconciliation for iniquity. It's time to search our hearts, Father in heaven. Are there any differences in my heart? Am I holding on to grudge, malice, unforgiveness in my heart? Oh, friends, locally and those online, even right now, it's time to search our hearts, dear God. Put the search light deep within that we may bear fruit of true reconciliation before we die, before the close of our probation. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Acts chapter 2. Where are we going to, my friends? Do you know what I see here? My sister, you're shaking your head, right? It's truth, right, sister? It's truth. Do you realize how many close disciples did Christ have? Twelve. Did they have any unity among them? Lord have mercy. Upon them and upon us. What was found among them? From the very beginning of Christ's ministry to the cross, strife, animosity, grudge, who shall be the greatest? If this spirit of dissension was found among Christ's closest disciples, would we call them present truth believers? Would we call them the remnant? They were the closest, my friends. Yet what was fun among them, even until the cross? So what would be found among, unfortunately, God's professed people in these last days? 
the same spirit of strife, evil surmisings, who shall be the greatest? Oh, my friends, it's time then to finish transgression, to make an end of sin, to bring in and make reconciliation for iniquities, thoughts, strife in our hearts, unforgiveness in our hearts for our brothers and sisters, both in the church and in our family circle, or else we are lost souls. Do you know what the cure was? There was a crisis that cured everything. What brought those disciples quickly on one accord, my friends? Mm -hmm. It was the cross. When Judas, do you see it now? When church and state, Pilate, Caiaphas, Herod, Pilate, when church and state united and crucified Jesus, and then the disciples now realize, why must there be fussing and war among us who profess the truth, the present truth, when really we are all on one team? Because church and state have both united to persecute us. Why are there wars and fightings among us? Let's find ourselves where? In the upper room. So do you know what will solve what's happening now, my friends? In the family circle, in the church, among so-called present truth preachers and ministries? The son, the law. You watch, my friends. But why wait until then? Why wait until then? Go to Hebrews chapter 2 with me. Close Acts. Why wait until then? It is now that we can call a brother. It's now that we can call a sister. The Bible says if you come to the altar, if you come to church, if you come to, I mean, where are we? Embassy, hotel, all right. If we come to the embassy hotel in Raleigh, North Carolina, and there, you remember, a brother, a sister has ought against you. What must you do? What must you do the next opportunity you get? Go make it right. Go first and reconcile with your brother, with your sister. Then Jesus will accept your offering. Then Jesus now can clothe you with his righteousness. Then Jesus can reconcile your balance sheet in heaven. Jesus is your great savior. Jesus is your heavenly accountant. Will you hire him? Do you know how expensive it is in some places to hire an accountant? Do you know why? You make a mistake on your taxes. You find yourself in prison. Is there a spiritual application? Can you see it, my friends? Oh, my friends, how much is it to hire Jesus? How much? How much? It's free. But guess what? It will cost us our lives. Everything that we have. And will he balance our accounts? But what if we don't hire him? We will make a mistake. Because all have what? Sinned. And where will we find ourselves? With Satan in prison for a thousand years. Where are, we, where are we going to? Hebrews. You know what? Close Hebrews. Put this on your... Well, let me give you the scripture. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9 through verse number 13. Verse 9 through verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says, if we accept Jesus, he covers us with his righteousness, he reconciles us to himself, and Jesus is not afraid to call us his brethren. We must be reconciled with our brother. Who is our elder brother? Who is our heavenly brother, Jesus, we must be reconciled to him. Leviticus chapter 8. Go there with me. Where are we going to, my friends? Now put this point on your paper. Reconciliation in the context of the sanctuary 
began in the outer court. Began where, my friends? It began where? In the outer court. Leave it to us, chapter 8. Now, I want to ask you a question. What was the altar a type of? The altar in the outer court. What was it a type of? The cross. The cross. The cross. Leave it to us, chapter 8. Write down these verses. Verse 14. Verse 15. Verse 16. The Bible says uh, that reconciliation, the last phrase of verse 15, the last phrase of verse 15, reconciliation took place where? At the altar. And what is in verse 16? What was taken away and burned on the altar? The fat. What fat is symbol of sin? So reconciliation in the context of the sanctuary began where? At the altar. Does that make sense now? So what happened when Christ came and died on the cross? What happened there then? The reconciliation of our account begun. Go to Colossians with me. Where are we going to my friends? Colossians chapter 1. This is present truth, but such subjects as the what? The sanctuary. Is that what we're studying now? Do you see it, my friends? In connection with the 2300 days. Question again. Where did reconciliation begin in the sanctuary layout? Where? At the altar in the outer court which typified the cross of Jesus. Colossians chapter 1. Where are we going to, my friends? Look at verse number 20. The Bible says this in verse 20. And having, are we there? And having made peace through what? The blood of his cross by him to reconcile, that's your word, to reconcile all things unto himself. By him I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Verse 21, and you that were what? Sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet when? Yet now hath he reconciled. So what happened on the cross of Calvary by Jesus Based on this scripture, he began to reconcile his people. But what's wrong with his people? Based on verse 21, what's wrong with your thoughts, my friends? What's wrong with your mind? Oh, my friend, amen. Verse 21, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by what? Wicked works, my friends. The cross of Calvary is to give us power over sin in our mind. The power over sin in our thoughts. Verse 22 now says something very startling. Verse 22, it says this, In the body of his flesh through death to present us how? Holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight the cross of calvary was to reconcile us so we can become born with jesus so jesus can now declare us how holy do you believe it all right again do you believe this do you know what's in verse 23 verse 23 is the condition by which we receive this reconciliation, what is in verse 23? What is the conditional phrase? What's the first word there, my friends? It says, if we continue in the faith. What is faith? Oh, beloved, what is faith? It's the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. What must we hope for? To get victor over what in our mind? Sin. The cross of Calvary shows us we can get victory, my friends. And then verse 27. 
And then verse 28 says, the mystery of God will be finished in us. And we shall be ready for the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus will then declare us perfect. I want to be declared perfect. How about you, my friends? But do you believe that Christ can give us this victory? Look at this. Colossians, pardon me, Ephesians chapter 2. Where are we going to, my friends? Ephesians chapter 2. I want to share with you something. I'm not sure if you have ever seen this beautiful scripture based on Christ's work on Calvary's cross to reconcile us unto himself. The Bible tells us Christ's death on Calvary's cross was for this primary reason, to reconcile us, to give us victory from the enmity in our minds. From what, my friends? All right. What text come to your mind about en enmity? What text? Enmity. Genesis. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. I will put what? Enmity in your heart. When did he begin to do it? Officially. Christ. When? Officially. In person. When? At the cross. Look at verse number 16. Are we there in verse 16? Watch verse 16, together what it says. And that he might what? Reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain what? Having slain the enmity thereby. So on the cross, Jesus began the work of reconciliation and to slay what in our minds? And to slay enmity. Can you give me a second scripture that talks about enmity? Anybody? Enmity? Romans 8 says what in verse 7? Let me start you off. Come on now. Come on, brother. Come on. For the what? It says what now? For the carnal mind is enmity. Let's read that. So notice now, when Christ died on Calvary's cross, it was to reconcile us to God and to slay the enmity. Where was the enmity? The carnal mind is enmity. Wow. The death of Christ on Calvary's cross is to give us victory over sin where? In our mind. Do you realize then, many who profess to preach the cross have not begun to preach it correctly? It's a perverted gospel because they claim to preach the cross, but then they say we can never get victory over sin. That's not the everlasting gospel. It's another gospel. It is a perverted gospel. Did you read that in the Bible? Verse 16, Ephesians chapter 2, Christ's death on the cross is to reconcile us and to slay the enmity. Where is that enmity? Go now. Romans chapter 8. Are we there, my friends? Romans chapter 8. What is in verse 7 now? Let's all read verse 7. What it says now, my friends? Because what? It says, because of, be, come on. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Pause right there. So can we get victory over sin in our minds? Why? Why? Because of the work of Christ, we're on the cross. Did we just read that? Do you believe it, my friends? Now, where is the enmity? So once he slays the enmity in our mind, what may we now keep by his power? What's in verse 7? Finish it now. Let's go. Because the what? The carnal mind is enmity against God. Why? Why? Because it is not subject to what? The law of God. Neither indeed can be. Wait a minute. So what is the carnal mind then? 
It's enmity. Why is it enmity against God? Come on, is it, come on verse 7. It doesn't want to keep the law. So Christ's death on the cross, it says, it reconciles us. My brother, you're singing, my brother, you're singing, right? Amen. It reconciles us and also it slays the enmity we're in our minds. So if we're no longer carnal, how then will Christ declare us righteous? What now can we now keep since we are no longer carnal? The law. Oh, my friends. This is the gospel. This is present truth. If it's clear, my friends, say amen. amen. So now, must I sit down now? Because I just preached the cross. Right? And the Bible says Christ began to reconcile us at the cross. Right? Leviticus chapter 8 says reconciliation begins where at the altar that's the gospel right that's it right in its entirety right no because the bible says now the final reconciliation takes place in the most holy place go to leviticus 16 now oh my friends um, are we seventh day adventists we have a message to give to the world. The men from Babylon, they only stop at the cross. And when they preach the cross, it's a perversion of the cross. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we can prove reconciliation begins here at the cross. But it doesn't stop there. It continues and ends where? In the most holy place. Of the heavenly sanctuary, Jesus wants us to finish transgression, to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in what, my brother? Everlasting, you're getting it, everlasting righteousness that we might no longer be at odds, warring with God, but be at peace with Him. Friends, do you want to be at peace with Christ? Raise your hand. Watch this. Where are we going to? Leviticus 16, we're closing. Watch this, my friends. Back to the screen. This is a beautiful quote. I love it. Oh, I love it. Selected messages. Book one, page three, nine, five. From top, it says this. Friends, read slowly. Red words from top. What it says. The believer is not called upon to make his peace with God. Why? He never has, nor ever can do this. No, let that sink in. You can never make your peace with God. Let that sink in. Read on, next sentence. He is to accept Christ as his peace. For with Christ, is God and peace. What is the next sentence now? Come on. Christ made an end of sin. Pause. Do you believe that? Did Jesus make an end of sin? So if we accept Christ, what can he do within me? What can he do within you? If you believe it, say amen. amen. Oh, beloved, it says, Christ, let's read on, made what? An end of sin. Bearing its heavy curse in his own body on the tree. And he hath taken away the curse from all those who believe in him as a personal savior. Read the next sentence now with energy. Come on. He makes an end of the controlling power of sin. We're in the heart and the life and character of the believer testify to the genuine character of the grace of Christ every fiber every cell every tissue in my being with everything I believe this yes. he can make an end of the controlling power of sin in my life 
Jesus can make an end of the controlling power towards perverted appetite, worldly music, the worldly dress, oh my friends, the worldly videos and conversation, the sin of un unforgiveness in our minds, Jesus can make an end of the controlling power of sin in our lives and then we can demonstrate we have been saved. We can demonstrate we are being saved. I don't care what your struggles are, drugs, he can give you victory. Coffee drinking, he can give you victory. Back to the screen, please. To those that ask him, Christ imparts the Holy Spirit, for it is necessary that every believer should be what? Delivered from what, my friends? Pollution. As well as from the curse and condemnation of the law. Through the work of the Holy Spirit, the sanctification of the truth, the believer becomes fitted for the courts of heaven. For Christ works within us. And what now? And his righteousness is upon us. Listen carefully. Without this, no soul will be entitled to heaven. Do you want to go to heaven? But is there hope for you, friends? Yeah. All right. Last sentence. Thus what? Come on now. Thus who? Thus Christ makes an end of the curse of sin and sets the believing soul free from its action and effect. John chapter 8, verse 32. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Verse 36, if the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be how? Free indeed. Can Jesus make an end of sin in our lives and cover us with his righteousness? This is the only entitlement that we have for heaven. Do you want to go to heaven, my friend? But it didn't end at the cross. Leviticus chapter 18. Let's wrap this up. You, get the, you have gotten the points, right, my friends? Leviticus what chapter? Leviticus 18. Watch carefully, carefully. Because, friends, what is happening tomorrow, October 22nd? The memorial of Christ's movement from the holy place to where? The most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary to perform the closing work of salvation. Amen. The cleansing Amen. of the sanctuary. The cleansing of his people. It's also called the reconciling of our accounts. It takes place not only at the altar, at the cross, in the courtyard, but in the most holy place. Leviticus 16. Are we there, my friends? Watch carefully. Verse 20. Verse 20. It says this. And when... He hath made what now, friends? Come on now. And when he had made what? An end of reconciling the holy place, underscore reconciling, an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle and the altar, he shall bring what the life goes, and Aaron shall lay both his hands upon whom? The head of the live goat. And where was that live goat brought? The scapegoat into the wilderness. What happened to the scapegoat afterward? It died. Typifying who, what, and when? Typifying who? Satan. What? The removal of sin. Making an end of sin. Praise God. When? Uh, when? The second coming, the 1,000 years and after. Do you see it? Where was Aaron now? Making reconciliation. Verse 15, verse 16, he goes into where? The most holy place in front of the mercy seat within the veil. Where was the mercy seat place? 
in the most holy place. Beside verse number 15, put down this scripture. Exodus 26, verse 33, verse 34. Reconciliation takes place where? In the most holy place within the veil. Is a present truth for us now, my friends. We have come full circle. So what does Christ say in Daniel 9.24 now? 70 weeks are for the Jews to finish transgression. We have come full circle to make an end of sins. And what now? To make reconciliation. For what? Iniquity. Did Christ come and begin the work at the cross? In 31 AD. But it doesn't stop there. Where is he now? In the most holy place. And based on Leviticus 16, what is he now doing? Making reconciliation to close up the work of salvation. Is it clear, my friends? God has a part. We have a part. Man's part is very small. But God's part is very large. Look at verse number 29. Man's part is to afflict the soul. God's part is to cleanse. Oh, my friends. So what's man's part again? No, let's read that. Verse 29. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on what day? The tenth day of the month, what must everyone do? Afflict their souls so what is man's work to surrender to confess our sins if you afflict your soul it means you have godly sorrow for sin what is God's work verse 30 on that day shall who now the priest make what my friends an atonement for you to what to cleanse you that you may be clean from how many sins how many sins from all of your sins let's close second corinthians chapter 5 where we're going to my friends man's part is to surrender god's part is to cleanse will christ do his part if we neglect our part no my friends so will you choose to surrender all to Jesus? So he can cleanse us, clothe us with his righteousness and reconcile our account and save us. Will you surrender? Who chooses today to surrender all to Christ? Raise your hand, my friend. When we leave here, we have a mission to accomplish. Yes. Second Corinthians 5. Are we there, my friends? Verse 17 says, if any man be in Christ, he's a what creature? He's a what creature? Can we be new today? How? Surrender. Surrender sincerely. Confess your sins. Make a desired attempt and will, a choice, never to sin again. God accepts your sincere confession and treats you as if you never sinned. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. If any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature. All things are what? Pass away. Behold, all things are become how? New. Verse 18 now. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself. By whom? By Christ Jesus. And hath given to us what ministry? What ministry? The ministry of reconciliation can anyone tell me now what this means now because this is our ministry now the ministry of reconciliation what does that mean to you now anybody come on right here anybody what now it is it is to live and to proclaim the three angels now why do you say that because at the cross, the altar, reconciliation. In the most holy place, reconciliation. Do you see it now? That is the three angels' messages wrapped up. The everlasting gospel. What else? The ministry of reconciliation. What else? 
What else? What about you and your wife? You see, you won't, you won't even say it. You're afraid to say it. It's the ministry of one, my friends, reconciliation. Why? You cannot reconcile in verse 18, verse 19, until you experience verse 17. If any husband be in Christ, he's a new creature. All things are passed away. You know, many a wife has cancer, lupus, stress. Who is to be blamed? Partially. The husband and vice versa the wife you can never be reconciled until we are new creatures in Christ and then to have reconciliation all things are what passed away behold what now friends all things are become how new one reason why it's difficult for husband and wife to be reconciled one they're not new creatures they have not yet given their hearts to Christ. And they refuse to treat each other as Christ promises to treat them. When we commit and confess our sins to Christ, does he cover our sins? Does Christ keep replaying our sins on Sunday, then on Tuesday, then on Thursday, even in the car coming to church on Sabbath, does Christ keep replaying our sins? No, all things are what, my friends? Passed away. I see you now as Jesus sees you. Mm. Let that sink in. We keep replaying the past. And say, now, husband, I cannot trust you because of what you did last week, last month, last year, a decade ago. Wait a minute. 20 years ago. And people are going to their graves with unforgiveness. No reconciliation. You are dying lost. Now, why did I come back here? Why? Why? God must be saying something to somebody locally here and somebody online. Why did I come back to this point? Keep replaying the past. That's why Sister White says in early writings, page 119, if pride and selfishness were laid aside five minutes, five minutes, how many minutes? Five minutes would solve most problems. Five minutes. Not one whole night, not one whole month, not years, five minutes. You keep replaying the same old, same old. If your husband goes down in sackcloth and ashes, if your wife goes down in sackcloth and ashes, confessing sins to Christ and thoughts to you, accept him. Accept her as Christ would accept him or her. All things are in the past now, my friends. And the Bible says when Elijah comes, he sets the home in order. Probation is about to close. Our homes are in disarray. And as a, who was that? Isaiah said to King Hezekiah, judgment is coming. King Set thine house in order. It's time, my friends. The end is upon us. Signs all around us. Show us this. A son, the law is near. It's time to get ready. Put 15 minutes on the clock back there. All right? Watch carefully. We have no time to lose, my friends. Sister White says, God is withholding his second advent until his people receive the message and the experience of righteousness by faith. True reconciliation. That means I can stand here the next 15 to 20 minutes and talk about and share with you the nearness of a son the law and the son of the law may not come in our generation. 
because the church is unprepared. What if God was to bring it on? We wouldn't be ready. Look at this right here. Watch carefully. Look at the screen. Volume 6, page 19. The Lord God of heaven will not send upon the world his judgments. That's seven last plagues, second death. For disobedience and transgression until, what my friends? He has sent his watchmen to give the warning. He will not close up the period of probation until what? The message shall be more distinctly proclaimed. The law of God is to be magnified. Its claims must be presented in their true sacred character that the people may be brought to the side for, for or against the truth. Yet, the work will be cut short in what? Righteousness. The message of what, my friends? Christ's righteousness is the sound from one end of the earth to the other to prepare the way of the Lord. So where are the modern day John the Baptists? To prepare the way of the Lord with a message and a true experience. This is the glory of God, which closes the work of what? The third angel. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark. Gospel workers, 301. Second paragraph. But this I do know, Sister White says. Let's read that. That our churches are dying for the want of teaching on the subject of righteousness by faith in Christ and on kindred truths. The church is dying. We have been emphasizing what's coming tomorrow. October 22nd, right? A memorial of Christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary to close the work of probation to blot out sins. But what's coming a week after? October 31st, 2017. The Protestant Reformation on paper, Catholics, Protestants will sign. It is over. And there was a specific video that was shot, aired about seven months ago that began to circulate around Adventist circles. Did you see it? Now, I want to add to that. Watch what's coming. This shows us October 31st, 2017, the death nail, the death nail in the coffin for Protestantism based on the word of Catholics and Protestants. And then we come to Luther protesting against what? The doctrine of indulgences. We cover that. But the papacy is now saying, Pope Francis is now saying, that Catholics now believe in what? Justification by faith, right? As did Martin Luther, right? If that were the case, he would not be offering indulgence. The papacy has not changed. Here's a video. So this is uh, Kenneth Copeland telling his church to mark this date, October 24th through October 26th of 2017. What's coming? Here it is on the screen. This is, I believe, Kairos, Kairos, 2017, United in Christ. Am I echoing? 
in Christ. Kairos 2017. Look at the tagline. It says here, so let's all unite Protestants and Catholics. What a picture. What a flyer. What an invitation. To the left, a Catholic. On the right, a professed Protestant. Tagline. Let all unite in Christ so the world will know Jesus. I'm going to play a second video. Kenneth Copeland. Misunderstandings and sometimes wars began to give way to the reconciliation and recognition of the gifts of the Holy Spirit as placed within the body of Christ. Listen, listen, listen. It ended. Pause. Notice the language they're using also. What are we studying? Reconciliation. So while the true reconciliation must be going forward, the counterfeit reconciliation is happening between Catholics and Protestants to end the Protestant Reformation and to persecute the true Protestants. Can we not see what's happening? And it was Kenneth Copeland who quoted from the 1999 document, written, drafted, signed by Catholics and Lutherans, Protestants stating the protest is over because Catholics now believe in justification by faith. But I told you, in that very document, it mentions to receive salvation Justification, you must accept the sacraments of the Catholic Church and penance of the Catholic Church. Is that justification by faith? Now, look at this. I covered this before, so I won't spend much time here. Here it is, line 16, 28, 29, penance. There it is, line 30, line 34, penance. But of course, the reformers preached against penance, stating it can never bring justification by faith on the screen. Watch carefully, friends. There it is again. Now, this is at the same meeting, hear me now, with Kenneth Copeland. And remember, this all began in the church of Kenneth Copeland with a man called Tony Palmer, and the Pope sent his video. That means then, oh, I can't say that. I can't say that. Let me leave that one. These men mentioned the work and the words of a man called Lou Engel, stating, in order to heal a divided nation, Catholics and Protestants must unite. Is America divided today? Politically, religiously, socially, yes. And what are they saying is the solution? Catholics and Protestants, if they unite, then they can win the world to Christ and heal the wound. Watch this video. Lou Engel said it best. 
He said a divided church cannot heal a divided nation. Divided church cannot heal a divided nation. We must come together if we're to save this nation. And if we come together, then revival can break out and things will change forever. Mercy. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Mateo. The church must what? Now here it is. Look at these men. You will see them again. Look at the screen. There's Lou Engel. Let's read this. Only a what? Only a united church can what? Heal a divided nation. Once Catholics and Protestants unite October 31st, you just heard, revival will come now to America and things will change forever. What revival will this be? Counterfeit. So since the counterfeit is coming, where is the genuine? It comes after. How close then is the counterfeit a week and a half from now? Did you get that? So how close then is the genuine? Two weeks from now. It's here, my friends. It's here. Things are going to change as son the law is near. Look at this right here. Let's see if Sister White was really inspired. In Great Controversy, page 444, she says, In America, many people say, the churches can never unite because they all believe different doctrines from Scripture. Catholics believe one thing, Protestants something else, Lutherans one thing, Baptists something else. Amen? Amen. But she says now, red words, to secure such a union, the discussion of subjects upon which all were not agreed, however important they might be, from a Bible standpoint, must what? They must necessarily be waived. That means they will say, let's put aside our doctrinal differences and let us just unite to win the world. Is that going on now? Was Sister White inspired? Amen. Was she, my friends? Amen. And then she says, on page 445, once they unite, America forms an image and then comes Persecution for God's people. Is that point clear? Look at this now. Watch the screen. This is Kairos 2017 in Kansas City. What's today's date? 21st? Next week. Watch carefully. In October 2017, listen carefully. This will be, what my friends? An historic conference with leaders from where? Catholic, Protestant, and Orthodox churches. This year is a year of destiny. A year of what, my friends? Destiny. It's a year of destiny. We believe that God is calling his people to unity in Christ, as Christ prayed in John 17. So the world will believe that God sent his son. Let's read now, red words. This unity... It's not about doctrines, but on spiritual unity. Do you see it, friends? Was Sister White inspired? Recognizing the contributions of each diverse group, the hope of which can bring what now? Healing and revival to the nation. Did God give us a messenger? Inspired. Next sentence. Kansas City, and if you do your research, if you go back to Kansas, Kansas, that breakout, Azusa, the false revival, the speaking in tongues, among the charismatics, it was in California as well as in Kansas. Do your history, friend. It's coming again. Watch. Kansas City in 2017 is a year, the year to build gaps. 
to build a chasm. To build a precipice. <laughs> to build what, my friends? Between whom? 2017 is the year, they say, to build bridges with other interdenominational leaders to accept our differences, celebrate our diversity, and help heal the wounds. What wounds? The wounds of the past between what groups? Denominations, churches. Who are they uniting with? Catholics and Protestants. 2017 is the year to build that bridge. Every one of us locally and online should not leave this place today or leave live stream right now until we secure our salvation in Christ. Amen. They say this is the year to build that bridge. And Sister White says, you will know when the Son of the Lord is near and the second coming of Jesus when Protestants shall stretch their hands across the gulf. What's the gulf? A chasm. What's the gulf? But they will stretch their hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism, reach over the abyss. What's an abyss? Reach over the abyss to clasp hand with the Roman power. What are the, what are the Protestants now saying? 2017 is the year to build the bridge. For the hand to go over now and grab spiritualism. And with the other hand, because we got two hands, right? Grab now the hands of whom now? The Roman power. And this threefold union bring the son the law. And we can only make it if we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ. We need an upper room experience, friends. Can you see it? Watch. Let's, who is also calling for healing wounds? Red words, top line. The Pope says what now? This commemoration, when? October 31st, between Catholics and Protestants, marks a dramatic shift as never in history have all wounds between traditions felt what, my friends? Closer to healing. October 1st, 2017, that was stated. Look at this now. What else did they say? This year's what? A year of what? Destiny. Blue words, the year to build what? Bridges. With whom? Catholics. To heal what? Wounds. What does Sister White say now? GC 588. Through the what now? The two great eras. The immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. Satan will bring the people under his deceptions. While the former lays the foundation of spiritualism, the latter creates a bond of sympathy with Rome. Let's read now slowly. The Protestants of we're America, US, will be foremost in stretching their hands across the what? The gulf, that's the bridge. To grasp the hand of spiritualism, they'll reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power. What happens next now, my friends? And under the what? This threefold union, this country, America, will what now? Will follow in the steps of Rome in doing what? In trampling upon the rights of conscience. This was written in the 1880s. We're in 2017 now, when the Protestants of the US are saying, it's time to build that breach between Protestants and Catholics. This year, they would do it. When? October 31st. That means we can now expect a son the law anytime soon. We can now expect it now, friends. 
And the sad reality is, don't take this as, as a condemnation. Go call your Seventh-day Adventist friends and family members who went to church today. Ask them, what did you hear today? Did you hear anything about October 22nd, 1844? Did you hear anything about October 31st, 2017? Did you hear anything about reconciliation? The true and the counterfeit. And you will see our church is dying. My last point. Sister White says, there are three enemies of Satan to bring that son the law. What are they? Catholics, Protestants. What's number three? Spiritualism. Spiritualism. Is that rampant today? Is spiritualism calling for a son the law also? Look at this. Who is she? October 18th, 2017. Look at what Oprah said on CBS News and ABC News. And tell me if you don't see spiritualism and spiritualistic people are calling for a Sunday law. Watch this. Headline, Oprah Winfrey on new book. What is her new book's title? Wisdom of Sundays. What is the book's title? Oprah Winfrey brought friends over the weekend for a gospel brunch to celebrate her new book, The Wisdom of Sundays. Tagline, life-changing insights from super soul conversations. What does that sound like? The Super Bowl. And remember now, they're saying to solve the Super Bowl's issue, we need Sunday worship. I gave you that before. Watch this, the red words. Super Soul Sunday, where Winfrey has in-depth conversations. With whom? With spiritual thinkers, like whom? Tony Robbins, Shonda Rhimes, and whom? Buddhist monk. Spiritualism. Watch, she says next. You have a mind, a body, and a spirit. Let's nurture all three. How? Watch this. Winf Red words. Winfrey said, spirituality to her is the, quote, desire to fulfill the highest expression of truth in ourselves. So where must you find truth? What is that? Find truth in yourselves. What is that? That's spiritualism. And that it is the essence of who you are. Spiritualism. Calling for what? Sunday worship. And that's what Sister White says in GC 554. The throne is within you. Look within for help. Self-help books. Super Soul Sunday. Sun, why on Sunday? What must you do on Sunday, Oprah? She says, uh, reach out to God on Sunday. Do you see it now, friends? Watch. Here it is. Here it is. Not my words. ABC News. Oprah explains her new book now, Wisdom of Sundays. Skip on down. Oprah Winfrey explains why her new book, Wisdom of Sundays, is what? Life-changing. My intention with the book is to offer on every page an opportunity to find a way to be closer to who? To yourself. Closer to the heart that you believe. Closer to the name you refer to God as being. Closer to bigger. Closer to a better life. On what day? On Sunday. To find a way. Because I believe, said Oprah, 
that there are all kinds of avenues, different paths leading to the same goal. And the highest goal, the highest goal, the highest goal is the truest expression of yourself as a human being. So take Sunday to seek the one whom you call God and to exalt self. Is that not what Satan said to Eve in the garden? You shall become as God's knowing both good and evil. Self-exaltation on what day? Sunday, super soul on Sunday. That's why it's dangerous to watch these Hollywood stars. The spirit of Oprah and others will permeate your mind. They don't know any better so we must give them the gospel and don't sit there, have them give us what they think is the gospel. It's a perversion of the gospel. Isaiah, go there, Isaiah chapter 54. Where are we going to, my friends? Isaiah 54. The highest goal is not self. In the book Education, book this, page 18, Sister White says, higher than the highest human thought can reach. It's God's ideal for his children. Godliness, Christ-likeness is the goal to be reached. Not self-exaltation, but dying so Christ can be exalted in our lives. Friends, our son the law is near. Can you see it, friends? Am I ready? And do you know we will be persecuted? Do you know parents and children may be separated? Yes. We will lose every earthly comfort in life. Yes. Am I ready? Yes. Now, friends, if you thought this was a joke, this must sober you up now. How could Sister White say this all the way in the 1800s? And October 18th, 2017, the Protestants are now saying, this year, October 31st, we will build that bridge. We will grasp hand with the papacy. Wake up, my friends. And that's why I want to give you this. Isaiah 54, verse 13 says, And all thy children shall be what? Taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. Verse 14, In righteousness, shall thou be established thou shalt be far from oppression let's read now for thou shalt not fear and from terror for it shall not come near thee is terror coming is a crisis coming but what must establish us in verse 14 the lord's righteousness that's it. And what's in verse 17? No weapon. Ah, friends. No what? So don't fear the Sunday law that's coming. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise up against you shall be what? Condemned. Why, my friends? Christ will protect you, preserve you, with his righteousness. One question. Do you see your need for Christ's righteousness? Amen. Why not raise your hand right now? If you see your need, will you recommit your life to God today? Hands down. Will you re recommit your life to God today? Even those online, will you? Did you comprehend what you heard today? You did? Well, I call heaven and earth to record, to witness against you today. But I, by God's grace, have set before you life and death. I have set before you blessing and curses. And I told you to choose life, that you and your seed, you and your children, you and your household may be saved. Did you hear what God said today? Do you believe he can save you today? 
Kneel with me right now. Father in heaven, we thank you for your words. Bless every hand that was raised. Thank you for the heavenly eye salve that we could discern the signs of the times. Save us, dear God. Our hands were raised. We're now on bended knees because we believe that we have no righteousness by which to be saved. So we cling to yours. Reconcile us. Reconcile our account. Balance the sheet for us, dear God. And we thank you for this hope that only is found in Jesus. Bless every home that's here, even those online, that we will be found not playing games with our salvation. The hour is late, but to be found setting our homes, our lives in order based on your word. Let there be true reconciliation between husband and wife brother with brother, sister with sister, ourselves and you, and send us forward with the true message, the true, the true ministry, the true experience of reconciliation is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.